right, geography fans, we're on key issue three of chapter eight, and we're going to take a look at why do states cooperate with each other. There are two main reasons why this happens. The first is political and military, and the second is economic. So let's go ahead and take a look at that first one, the political and military reasons states cooperate. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the political and military aspect of countries cooperating. During the Cold War, we start seeing a very polarized Earth. We start seeing people have to side with either communism or democracy. But we're going to get to more of that later, because there have been attempts at world organizations. After World War I, European nations wanted to avoid war at all costs. So they created something called the League of Nations. It never was very successful and never really took off, in part because the United States refused to be a member and wanted to remain neutral in world affairs. Well, the League of Nations fails. We have World War II. After World War II, the United States sponsors a world organization called the United Nations, or the UN. That's the same UN that's around today. The main point of the UN is to try to talk out problems, to try to avoid war, to have countries that have a disagreement be able to go to a forum and talk it out and try to avoid it. However, the UN will step in with a military presence. See, any country that's a member of the UN must give soldiers or military support of some type, which could be jeeps, tanks, soldiers themselves, money, but they have to support the military aspect of it. Now, while the UN is supposed to be a peaceful organization, they will use military force to intervene. The problem is, many times it's very ineffective, and a lot of times the soldiers are unable to use their weapons so that they don't create a bigger issue. So the UN is a peacekeeping organization, or that's its main attempt, but it will use force when necessary. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at regional military alliances. Traditionally in world history, there's always been three or more superpowers. But after World War II, there's really only two left, the United States and the Soviet Union. That's it. But they did create a balance of power because neither side wanted to go to World War III. Well, during this time period, new supranational organizations really start to spring up. We get NATO, and NATO is the United States, Canada, and 14 other European nations. NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and its goal was to support democracy in that region, to reject communism. Well, the formation of NATO, the Soviet Union of Poland, creates something called the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw, the capital of Poland, is where they organized and met at. The Warsaw Pact were Eastern European countries that supported communism. So the entire Earth starts getting split between these two groups. And we start seeing the entire planet get forced to side with either the United States and democracy or the Soviet Union and communism. Now there were some other organizations brought up in your textbook. One was the Organization of American States. This is an alliance of all countries in North and South America and Central America. All of them aligned together. I think there's about 35. They formed the OAS. And another example on top of that was the African Union. And the African Union started forming in the 60s, but in 2002 reformed into the modern day African Union. And this is a group that rejected colonialism, rejected apartheid, and they're trying to support each other in Africa to better their economic status. Another supranational organization is the British Commonwealth. The British Commonwealth includes the members of the UK, Canada, Australia, and many other colonies that are around. So when we look at these organizations, Sometimes it's for a military um, defense or military reason, and other times it's just to have uh, trade negotiations with. All right, so in looking at supranational organizations or reasons why countries work together, another reason is economics. During the Cold War, the Earth was very, very bipolar. Basically, you had to either serve with the Soviet Union or the United States. You had to align yourself with democracy or communism. And most of it was focused on military alliances for your defense. Well, after 1992, when the Soviet Union collapses, countries are able to start focusing on the economics of their um, country. 
And we start seeing this in Europe. For years, Europe tried to get some kind of an organization there for free trade. Europe is a smaller area with countries that are very close. Nothing ever really took off until the European Union. In the 80s and 90s, the EU is very, very successful. It currently has 27 countries, has a common currency called the Euro, and has free trade. Well, what we mean by free trade is that you can trade in one country to the other without having to have your semi-surged, without having to pay tariffs, which is a tax. You could just freely go from Germany, load your truck up, go into France, unload it, and sell your goods. In the United States and Canada, you've got to go through a border patrol. You've got to have your truck searched. You've got to pay tariffs. So we don't have that same kind of free trade. This is very successful in Europe because it's more about profitability. You're paying less in taxes. That means more profit. There are two major countries in Europe that are not members, Norway and Switzerland. They have been very well known for being neutral throughout history, and they continue to be. Parts of Yugoslavia are still trying to join. So you have the areas of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the surrounding areas of balkanized that Balkanized that split up when Yugoslavia uh, collapsed that are still waiting to join. And what the EU is waiting for is to make sure their economies are stable, to make sure their economies lift a little bit so that a poorer country doesn't bring down the EU, and to make sure that their governments are stable. Now an interesting country that has asked to join is Turkey. Turkey is an Asian country. Even though they have a little bit part in Europe, they're still an Asian country. But they want to align themselves with Europe. Europe is much more financially stable and has a lot more economic opportunities for Turkey. So Turkey has asked to join. The only couple things that are really holding them up is they want to make sure their economy is good. The EU also wants to make sure they are politically stable, that they have had skirmishes with the Kurds in the east, uh, a nomadic tribe. So they want to make sure that's all taken care of. The other sticking point is the fact that they are a Muslim country, and they would be the first Muslim country to join the EU. And we know, just like in America, there can still be some distrust between Christianity and the Muslim nations of the Middle East. Turkey probably will join, it probably won't be too far away, and it's a great trade gateway for the Europeans into Asia.